All righty. Uh, hi, everyone, again. I'm Sam. Um, I'm going to be giving you a quick introduction and overview of the XMPP protocol. Uh, I formerly served as the XSF uh, editor, the editor for the XC extension series of documents, which we'll talk about a bit today, um, and informally was on the, uh, the council, the sort of the technical governing body of the XMPP Standards Foundation. Uh, so I've been doing XMPP for a decent amount of time. Um, let's get started. So a lot of people think of XMPP as specifically a chat protocol, but really it's a more general protocol for exchanging data uh, in near real time between any number of networked, networked entities. Um, so sort of like HTTP is used on the web, XMPP is another internet protocol that's uh, used for a lot more than just chat. And we're mostly going to focus on chat today, um, but we'll also discuss some of the sort of a high level overview of the protocol in general and uh, and you'll maybe see and show some examples later of areas where it's not used just for chat. Um, it was standardized by the Internet Engineering Task Force. They're, they maintain the kind of core protocol, the instant messaging sub protocol, um, the address format, things of that nature. And then the XMPP Standards Foundation is the uh, maintains all of the extensions. Uh, XMPP stands for Extensible Messaging and Presence Protocol. And the extensible part is what the XMPP Standards Foundation, the XSF, manages. Um, it was sort of first created around in the late 90s uh, by the Jabber open source community. You'll hear Jabber used a lot. That's sort of often used interchangeably with XMPP. That was sort of the historical name. Um, it pretty quickly in the early 2000s moved towards IETF standardization. Uh, and then in around uh, in the sort of late uh, 2000s, uh, Cisco acquired the sort of original Jabber company, which is why the Jabber name kind of fell out of favor. Um, they pulled some trademark shenanigans and trademarked the name, and uh, and XMPP became really what it was, uh, the kind of the name it was, the protocol itself was known as. Uh, and then throughout the years, there's been some other minor modifications. There was a new version of the protocol, WebSocket sub-protocol for connecting from web clients once WebSockets became a thing. Um, and the address format has been updated to have some, and uh, and sort of how we use TLS has been updated to keep up with security requirements and to and uh, internationalization changes. Uh, but overall, the, the basic core XMPP protocol has remained largely similar to what it was in the late 90s. Um, from sort of 10,000 feet, uh, the protocol uses XML streams, not documents. Uh, this is not like um, uh, the WebSocket subprotocol does this a little differently, but unlike a lot of chat protocols, we're not sending individually consumable documents. Uh, from the moment we connect to the moment we disconnect, we have one kind of continuous stream where the whole thing has to be parsed together, uh, not, uh, not as individual documents for every single payload being sent. Uh, the payloads that are sent are broadly divided up into two types, stanzas, which are message, presence, and IQ, which we'll talk about in a second. Those are sort of those core primitives of XMPP and anything else. Um, there's a sort of minimal core spec uh, managed by the IETF, like we said, and then lots and lots of XCPs for adding features and doing really whatever you want with the protocol. And most importantly, and the biggest benefit, I think, to using XMPP over other protocols is, like email, it's federated, um, which we will talk about right now. Uh, so if you have a client, uh, C1 in this example, and it's connected to a server, server one or S1, uh, you can send a client to server message. This is known as C2S uh, to that server. And let's say you wanted to communicate with a friend on server two, so that we're, we're not connected to the same server. Server one would connect to server two, send what, what's called a S2S or server to server message. And then that then the server two could forward that uh, message on to the second client. So we end up with this broad federated network, uh, as we said, similar to email. Um, to do that, we need an address format that actually supports this sort of uh, federated network. And XMPP uses something called a JID. Uh, JID stands for Jabber ID or, or uh, yeah, Jabber identifier for kind of legacy historical reasons. You'll hear this referred to as a JID most often, or sometimes an XMPP address. Uh, it looks broadly similar to an email, except it's got this little extra part uh, on the end after a slash, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, the, ooh, if I can go to the next slide, there we go. The local part of a JID is exactly the same as it is, is in an email. That's that little first bit before the at sign. 
And that defines the account on the server, the specific account we're referring to. So that refers to you, the user. Uh, the domain part, of course, refers to the actual specific server we're connecting to. In this example, it's uh, shakespeare.lit. Uh, so that's how we actually kind of create that initial connection. If we're a client connecting to viola at shakespeare.lit, we know to do a DNS lookup for shakespeare.lit. We do some uh, fancy DNS stuff, figure out where to connect, make that connection. Um, and then uh, together, those are called the bear jid. Uh, that's, so this refers to a complete bear jid, viola at shakespeare.net or dot lit uh, in this example is sort of references an account on right an account on the server this is how you would address um, a message you're sending to a friend uh, and then there's the full jet includes this last little bit we call the resource part uh, this is what i think sort of the interesting and unique thing about xmpp um, yeah or makes it unique compared to a lot of other federated protocols uh, the resource part refers to a specific client so in xmpp we might have uh, if we're using it for chat we might have a desktop client as well as a mobile phone and a tablet and any number of other clients all connected at once and they're individually addressable with the resource part so together this is all viola at shakespeare.lit slash illyria uh, is called a full jid and full jids are kind of globally and uniquely addressable which is um, make or make cl individual clients globally and uniquely addressable which is sort of one of the special things about xmpp that makes it extremely flexible um, so now that we know what addresses look like, let's talk about the core protocol defined in RFC 6120. Uh, XMPP is client first. So regardless, no matter what, if we're a, a, an instant messaging or using it for something else, the client always initiates that connection with the server. There are two streams, an input and an output stream. Uh, these occur over a single TCP socket for the most part uh, in terms of the client to server connection, which is what we'll be focusing on today. Um, and as a security measure, they are restarted whenever the stream state changes. Uh, so for example, if we negotiate that we're going to upgrade from plain text to TLS, or we're going to start um, go from uncompressed to a compressed connection, we restart the stream sort of from scratch, throw out all the state we had before, uh, and start a new one inside that new layer. And we'll show that in just a second. Uh, but the, that's really a, a really nice security precaution because it means we we do have a sort of stateful stream and we don't want to accidentally leak state that uh, that we established outside of TLS or inside of it and leak it across that boundary. Uh, and finally, these streams are event-based and pipeline. So this means that XMPP is an asynchronous protocol as opposed to HTTP where broadly speaking, it's uh, entirely synchronous. You make a request, you get a response. You make another request, you get another response. Uh, XMPP, you might make any number of requests, get response back slowly. Uh, make a, make three requests, then get responses back uh, with some other requests interspersed. Every all communication is asynchronous, uh, with a sort of exception in session establishment, which we'll talk about next. Um, so before we actually get to all that asynchronous stuff, we have to connect to a server and actually create a session. Uh, so the client, like we said, it's a client-first protocol. The client will ignore. TLS and DNS for a second. Clients connect, then they start a stream. Uh, XMPB is all XML. Um, so the client starts a stream, the server responds by acknowledging that and creating, a, client starts the sort of its output stream, uh, server responds by starting a, uh, its input stream. So we have kind of two XML streams running uh, concurrently. The server then sends back a list of features that can be negotiated. Um, most of the time, <clears throat> excuse me, most of the time, this will just be TLS to start. We probably don't want to do authentication or anything else before we have upgraded to TLS, uh, unless we've done some other magic and already connected with TLS. But uh, traditionally, XMPP uses start TLS, where the server says, hey, we use TLS. Uh, it's required. Please upgrade. The client would then do some negotiation that's unique to that feature. In this case, it might send uh, that we want to select the start TLS feature. The server would tell it to proceed. And then we would send a TLS handshake. Um, this is that sort of area where we've now done changed the state of the stream. We've upgraded to TLS and everything inside is now encrypted. So we start over. We throw away all the state we had before and we start a new stream. The server responds by starting a new stream and responds with the list of features. 
Uh, TLS has already been negotiated, so we don't advertise that again. Uh, in this case, the server is just advertising authentication mechanisms. Uh, so it, right now, it's in this kind of small example, it's only uh, advertising the Scram SHA-1 authentication mechanism. The server would select that it wants to do auth and on and on and on until we've negotiated sort of all the features we want to use for the session. Um, so you'll notice this was all very synchronous, request response. Uh, once we're done with this, we negotiate a kind of final feature um, where we get that uh, the ad address we're going to use. Then we go into it. We switch from this sort of synchronous request response negotiation mode into our asynchronous stream. Uh, so let's talk about what happens inside the stream. Uh, that's where we start sending these asynchronous uh, things we mentioned earlier, all of the little XML payloads, uh, mostly stanzas. Um, so stanzas are sort of the basic primitive unit of meaning inside of an XMPP stream. Um, there are three of them, message, IQ, and presence. And these are the only routable elements in XMPP. If you want anything to go over a server-to-server -server connection and go to someone else on another, uh, any other or any other user on the same server, you have to wrap it in one of these three primitives. Um, so most things sent over the stream are going to start with message IQ or presence. Uh, messages are sort of what they sound like. They're not just used for chat messages, but they are. Uh, that is one use for them. They're sort of one-to-one. -one. Uh, you only send a message to one address. Uh, they're fire and forget. There's no acknowledgment, uh, generally speaking, or, um, or any sort of uh, the server doesn't confirm that it was delivered or anything like that. Uh, you just send it, you forget about it. And uh, so they're kind of useful for anything that doesn't require a response. Uh, chat messages being one example, of course. Um, alerts, uh, if you're doing a sort of push notifications or news alerts or that sort of thing where you just want to send something to uh, to someone and not and, you know assume that they will display it, uh, it's often used for logging. So if you're sending tons of log messages over a server to something that does log aggregation, message would be the way you want to do that. You don't want to generate tons and tons of traffic uh, waiting on acknowledgments for every single message you send. Uh, so it's one-on-one, -on -one, fire and forgets the important part. Uh, and you can see an example here with a, a body payload, which is often used for chat messages um, and a request for a read receipt. So in this case, there, uh, we may eventually get a receipt saying, yeah, the user opened their chat and saw this message. Um, but you can, one of the, the extensible part of XMPP is you could really put anything inside this message body uh, or inside this message as a payload. Uh, here, we just happen to use a chat message as an example. Uh, IQ stands for information query. This is one of the other types of stanzas. Uh, they are also one-on-one. -on -one. You only send them to a single recipient. Uh, however, unlike messages, these are acknowledged. Uh, the recipient always sends back something. That may be uh, a message saying, or an IQ saying, uh, we don't understand the payload you just sent, or it might be a response to whatever the extension uh, wrapped up in that payload was. Uh, so this gives you optional at least once delivery. You can always, if you don't get the response within a certain amount of time, you can retry because you know you're expecting a response. So in this example, uh, we have one of the extensions the XSF maintains is a simple way to ping another client or server or any address and say, hey, you know, are you there? Uh, and we see the result that, uh, Kind of corresponds to the uh, the response, the Pong. Um, so we can use this simple extension to ask almost any address uh, or any address. Are you there still? Um, so that's IQs. They're one on one, but they are. Uh, but you can expect a response. And finally, there's presence. Uh, presence can be directed. That is one on one, like message or IQ, or it can be uh, broadcast. That is one to many. Uh, they're used frequently to advertise entity availability on the network. Um, and they, uh, so things like uh, that's your sort of in a chat client, that would be your, uh, you are online or you are busy or you've just gone away or whatever, your little green dot. Um, or another example where presence is used, uh, the Nintendo Switch, for example, uses it when you're playing Mario Kart or whatever and your little uh, thing pops up that says, you know, someone in your friends list is online. Uh, that's done with XMPP presence. Um, and various payloads that you want to broadcast out to, you know, all of your friends can ride along. So these are things like uh, entity capabilities. Uh, your client might send out the, you know, I'm able to hear all the extensions and features I support. Uh, status messages, you know, your I'm listening to this song right now. Uh, anything you kind of want to broadcast to 
lots of people all at once. So it's a very effectively a very simple publish subscribe system. Uh, and we can see an example here of setting our status in a chat client. We're setting ourselves to away and sending a status message that all of our contacts can display. Uh, so you, you notice all of those examples had some sort of payload in it. Uh, payloads are generally handled. Uh, those are sort of the events, the things you're looking out for in a chat client or an application and triggering events based on. Uh, and those are generally handled by XML namespaces. So if we, uh, in this case, uh, we have our recent convention of using versioned URNs. In, uh, in this example, uh, we can see a result that of uh, to a MAM query, a uh, history query, which we'll, we'll see a little bit about MAM in just a second. But MAM is message archive management. So someone has asked the server, hey, give me chat history. And we see here a result. Um, we can tell that based on the result uh, by the namespace in the in the payload to the uh, message. So you are in XMPP MAM version one. Uh, and th so that's where the extensible in XMPP comes from. And that's what the XSF maintains is effectively all of these XML namespaces and what XML can exist within them. Uh, and that's sort of both the, the uh, biggest benefit and flaw of XMPP. Uh, when we design new extensions, we often say uh, you don't really want to invent new stream level elements. Put everything inside of a uh, inside of a stanza. These are the core building blocks of XMPP. They give you routability. They give you known semantics. Uh, every now and then you'll want to design a new top level stream element, but it's very rare since those can only be communicated with the server. They tend to be used for uh, sort of very specific niche applications. So, generally speaking, everything goes inside of a stanza. Um, so let's talk about some of those extensions and some of those namespaces and uh, just see a handful of useful things uh, that most th uh, most XMPP, at least chat clients, will implement. Um, uh, there are lots and lots and lots of these extensions. Like I just said, it's sort of XMPP's greatest strength and its greatest weakness. It means whatever product you're building, you can extend it yourself or find an existing extension so that you can have compatibility between clients. But it also means that lots of different clients don't implement the same set of extensions and have to have fallbacks and figure out what to do when other clients don't implement things. If I implement video chat and you don't, you know, do I gray out the button and tell you uh, what if what happens if only one of your clients implements it and not another? Um, so it can be confusing, but I also think it is really one of the uh, one of the greatest strengths of XMPP. And so a few kind of common ones. Uh, message carbons are often implemented in terms of chat clients. They're what's used to copy incoming messages to all of the various clients, uh, even if they, and so we don't want someone addressing messages just to your phone. We want it to go to your phone and your desktop and have a consistent view of the world everywhere. Uh, similarly, any, similarly, any message sent from your desktop, we want to be forwarded to your phone. Uh, so this sort of tweaks the, uh, the way in which messages are one-to-one. -one. It says also make copies of that message and send it to all the other clients that might need a consistent view of the world. Um, it's simple and gets the job done. It's widely implemented. Its behavior in some ways is not super well-defined. Uh, and we really hope one day that it, for now it's a great workaround, it works really well, but we kind of hope it can be replaced one day with message archive management, which we talked about a little while ago. Uh, message archive management or MAM is just chat history. Uh, you can store incoming outgoing messages on the server. New clients can access history and kind of give and download it and give themselves uh, give you backlog and chat history. Clients that have been offline for a bit or that uh, you know dropped a connection or something when they come back online can catch up and receive any messages that were sent while they were offline. Uh, and maybe one day it can be used to sort of replace carbons, but for now they're sort of two separate things. Um, oops, next slide. There we go. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about a myth. Uh, I hear often XMPP is I, I I tell people, hey, you should try, you know, consider conversations, for instance, or uh, or Snicket, mobile XMPP clients, and people say, oh, well, no, I don't want to use XMPP. Why would you use that? It's terrible on mobile devices. It'll you know eat my battery or uh, uses too much bandwidth or whatever. Um, I don't think this has ever been especially true, but I think the myth comes about because historically mobile clients have been very bad. Uh, I don't have any evidence to support this, but in the early 2000s, there was kind of a brief period where everybody was upgrading to XMPP. AOL and Yahoo were using it. Um, 
various phones would ship XMPP clients with their kind of SMS, you know, text messaging. Like this was sort of pre-smartphones, so you'd get your Java-based whatever feature phone uh, text messaging app, and that would let you uh, sign into an XMPP account to send text messages. And those were historically really badly written. You know, phones hadn't been around for a long time. We hadn't really figured, we didn't really have a good, they were developed on a budget. We didn't have a good grasp of what it meant to be mobile friendly. Um, but as a counterpoint, uh, I believe ISODE has deployed XMPP over 9,600 bit per second SATCOM as well as high frequency radio. Uh, so it turns out it works pretty well in both um, uh, low bandwidth and uh, and sort of high latency environments like uh, is often true on a mobile phone. So uh, XCP0352 uh, client state indication is uh, pretty widely supported. And it's a very, very simple extension that just says, uh, and it's an example of a place where we use these top level stream elements that are not stanzas, where we just tell the server, hey, we're active or inactive whatever that means. Uh, screen goes off, app loses focus, whatever that means on your specific device. Um, and the server can do what it wants with this data. The CSI itself uh, doesn't really specify what we should do, but this might mean things like stop sending presence or typing notifications. If the screen's off, we don't care that our client, our friend came online. We're not displaying that little green dot anyway. Uh, they might come online and go offline, you know, four or five times while our phone is in our pocket. Uh, once we send the active signal, then update us what their status was just once. Um, similarly, uh, XCP0268 mobile considerations kind of uh, disclaim with the disclaimer that I wrote this one tries to say, you know, explain lots of different things you can do to be mobile friendly um, and not eat your user's battery. So uh, when we're implementing CSI, the, the kind of TLDR of this is modems have a really long tail time. It takes a long time to start up a cellular modem uh, and be able to send data again. XMPP already uses a persistent TCP connection, which is great for this. It means we are we can have that connection go to sleep as long as no data is being sent. Uh, the mo or as long as no data is being sent over the, that connection, the modem can go to sleep. And then whenever we're ready to to wake it up, and we can transmit as much data as possible, um, get that all at once while the while the connection is awake and available, and then let the modem go back to sleep. So XMPP actually is pretty good over mobile connections, both historically because it used a persistent TCP connection, and especially now when we have lots of uh, extensions and sort of documents detailing how to be, you know, battery conscious on a mobile phone. Um, stream management is another thing that helps here. Uh, it lets you do stream resumption, so very fast reconnects, uh, and it does some kind of stanza TCP-like tracking of packets, so stanza acknowledgments. Uh, where it tracks the number of packets that have been sent. And then if we need to resume, we can say, hey, give us you know, everything we've missed since, uh, since stands a number, whatever. Um, it does have a few problems around sort of zombie states where a client's gone offline, but the stream hasn't timed out yet, just like a TCP connection, uh, except at uh, that higher application level. And just like most things, the answer is probably wait till we time out, then when we come back online, catch up using message archive management. Uh, so these are just a handful of examples, uh, or those were just a handful of examples of service things built on top of XMPP. The core protocol, we can connect, we can send stanzas. Uh, then anything else built on top of that lets us do kind of extra stuff, like be especially friendly on mobile or develop new features. Any number of services have taken this uh, and used it to develop things that aren't just chat, um, like the Nintendo Switch just using push notifications, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, various chat apps, it's pretty much the standard for in-game chat. Uh, so for example, uh, just off the top of my head, Warface uh, is a you know, shooting first-person shooter for the Nintendo Switch and other consoles that uh, I know uses this for chat. WhatsApp was sort of a modification of XMPP that's not federated. Uh, the dating app Grindr, um, Doom, I believe, uses it for chat. So all, all the things in this list use it for some of them for chat, some of them for other things like push notifications or Jitsi for video signaling. Uh, I've used these slides before, you may have seen them, but uh, it's got a huge diverse ecosystem of servers. They're pretty much exist for every client and platform or for every platform and in any, any language you might use. Same for clients. Uh, and of course, for libraries to help you develop your own uh, XMPP based products. This is something I see as a big bonus to using XMPP to build a product as a, or a service as opposed to 
inventing your own uh, chat, you know, protocol or using one of the sort of newer ones. Um, XMPP has been around for a while. It's figured out all the kind of a lot of the kinks. It works really well on mobile. It works really well on desktop. And you almost guaranteed to be able to find a library, import it, and get started right away without having to do lots more work or figure out how to use a library in another language because yours doesn't have one. Uh, so it's got a very broad ecosystem already in place. Uh, and that's pretty much it. I know I kind of breezed through a lot of stuff from a quick overview to how to connect to what stanzas are available and how to use them with uh, and some examples of extensions. Um, but I hope you got something useful out of that. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them.